¿Tú no has sentido alguna discriminación en tu vida por ser mexicano? Te digo. Yo he vivido en muchas partes del mundo. Y como quiera, se siente. ¿En dónde más que en Estados Unidos has encontrado discriminación por ser mexicano? Bueno, estábamos hablando de la discriminación. Hay tres personajes históricos en la historia del mormonismo en México que vienen siendo Rey Lucero Pratt, Harold Brown y Orwell L. Pierce. Nuestros comentarios que hemos encontrado en los últimos seis años que hemos estado en, involucrados en este proyecto indica que ellos fueron bien aceptados, bien queridos por, por la gente mexicana. ¿A qué puede usted atribuir esto? Porque déjame empezar a decir que el pueblo mexicano es muy sensible. Ellos sienten, aunque uno no diga nada. Ellos palpan, ellos sienten. Y se puede dar cuenta de una persona que es sincera. Sincera en el sentido que lo que dice, lo siente. Una cosa es decir una cosa y sentir otra. Pero el mexicano tiene ese don, por quizás, de poder captar y sentir cuando la persona es sincera. Y si ellos estos tres personajes que usted ha mencionado, han logrado el respeto y el amor y cariño sin discriminación, es porque lo han logrado, lo han merecido, por su trabajo, por su dedicación, y más que todo por su amor. Y quizás porque ellos no criticaban, y porque ellos no discriminaban. La clave de discriminación es de ambos lados. Y no, ellos fueron grandes líderes, bien aceptados y queridos porque se dieron a conocer, se dieron a amar. Sí. Bueno, Carl, el presidente Rey Lucero Pratt fue a México como misionero en 1907. Fue llamado inmediatamente, básicamente, a ser presidente de la misión y duró como presidente de misión por 24 años, hasta 1931. Su muerte fue inesperada ya que fue a una operación y no salió de ella. Pregunta, ¿por qué cree usted que la iglesia lo mantuvo como presidente de misión por tantos años? Y segundo, ¿qué impacto cree usted que tuvo con relación a la tercera convención o el movimiento este, por razón de que la gente ni la iglesia estaban esperando ese momento de, de su muerte? ¿Me explico? Uh -huh. No sé los detalles del presidente Pratt, Rey L. Pratt. Uh, he leído algo de él, pero uh, la convención fue después de eso. Inmediatamente después sí. de su muerte. Uh, Podría hablar un poco del sentimiento que tengo yo concerniente a la tercera convención. En cierto sentido el propósito o los, los, uh, los deseos de la convención eran buenas y dignas. La manera en que lo propusieron fue su gran error. ¿Me entiende? Uh, que buscaban presidente de misión mexicano. Está bien, pero estaban un poco prematuros. Que buscaban edificios, los necesitaban. Sí, que querían literatura, himnarios, escrituras traducidas, un deseo lógico, deseable y bueno. Las tres cosas que fundamentalmente eran los propósitos y las quejas, por decir así, de la tercera convención no eran malas. La manera en que empezaron a demandar o exigir, exigir más bien, eso sí, no les fue. No, les, no era buena táctica. Creo yo que en, los en la época de la con Tercera Convención, México en su ambiente político era desechar al extranjero. Nacionalizaron las industrias, ferrocarriles, minas, teléfonos, electricidad, 
petróleo, muchas cosas. Empezaron a nacionalizarse. Y en ese ambiente se encontraron los, los hermanos que formaron parte de la... Que, que eran los líderes de la Tercera Convención. Creo que ese movimiento nacional en México afectó un poco a la actitud de la Tercera Convención. Es mi opinión. Que sus deseos eran malas, no los eran. Pero algunas de sus solicitudes y exigencias eran prematuras para, el, para la época. Ahora la pregunta, creo me pasé de él, ¿no? <risa> bueno, uh, podemos platicar sobre ese punto. Sí, ese es otro tiempo. punto después, sí. I'd like to. I don't know a lot about it. I have Bautista's book. Very complicated. I've read about five or six chapters. It's hard to understand. Hard to, to, to understand. Yeah. Okay. He okay. had a he had a heavy bias. Yes, he did. Yeah. But he lived in the States. Also. Yes. That's well, he right. got up here, and this is where he got his yeah. discriminated. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the his first. His first wife was an American. Second. Meryl, second. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the colonies, uh, the, the, uh, the purpose for establishing the colonies and the impact that it has had, not only in Mexico, but worldwide as a church. Can you explain a little bit about that in English? People have asked me a number of times, having been from the colonies, what it was like there. And I said, it's like living in any other little Mormon community. The church was central in our lives. It's all we had. Uh, everyone was active. Very few inactive in my day in the colonies. Uh, I think the people that lived there because of their situation, they were a long ways from, should I say, modern civilization. Uh, they learned to depend on each other, on the church, on the Lord, I remember more than once the ward having a special fast for rain and not a cloud in the sky and raining before the meeting. Raining before the meeting was over. We were uh, an agrarian society, farmers, fruit growers, and depended on the Lord for the elements to live, to survive. And I think that created, in any situation, Mormon colonies and others, great faith in people. Uh, I think the colonies have contributed wherever. Uh, in Mexico, we've mentioned that. But wherever they have gone, everywhere I go, almost, uh, and I say call, they say, oh, which calls? And Mexico comes up. And there are people everywhere in the church that have had some connection to the colonies. Grandmother, great-grandmother, father, somebody. And I think it was a, an environment where faith was developed, where uh, family ties were important. And I just think it's... Uh, been a great, uh, and that can happen in other communities. We applaud the colonies, and people get all excited about the Mormon colonies. Well, it's wonderful. It's good to be excited about them. I get excited too. But they, I say again, were the southernmost colony of the great Western colonization. The church was small in those years. In 1949, there were only 50 stakes in the church. That's not very many. I should have mentioned on your thing, uh, on your tape, about the growth of the church in Mexico. The stakes, and how many there are there? 185. First one in 61. You divide that over 40 years, you put 40 into 180 something, you've got how many stakes a year? Four. Yeah, one every two or three months. And, uh, yes, well, I've got off the subject. The colonies have given great leadership wherever they go. Wherever the people who are born and raised in the colonies, the uh, 
have been active members of the church most everywhere they go. Can you mention mission presidents? Uh, General oh, Biden? should I do that? <clears throat> A study has been made, <clears throat> and I was involved in part of that, on the number of mission presidents from the colonies who have served. Uh, for basis, for background, we went to the missionary department, the church historical department, to get sure of our dates and our names and missions they served in. As of today, there are 117 mission presidents who have served or are serving from Mexico, from the Mormon colonies. I don't think there's a, a stake in the church that come anywhere near that. Part of it was because uh, we knew Spanish. We were born in Mexico and knew the language. And so it was uh, at least handy or convenient that we be called to be mission presidents. But I remember as I was called, giving my farewell, a dear sister came up after church and said, Oh, Brother Call, you'll make a great mission president because you speak Spanish. I said, Sister, everyone in Mexico speaks Spanish. That's not the primary requirement. <laughs> but, yes, and then the general authorities. We've had President Ivans, President Romney, both apostles, both members of the First Presidency, Waldo Call as a 70, Gerald Taylor, Eren Call, and uh, Robert Wetton, Bob Wetton. And so... Uh, Yes, and temple presidents. There have probably been eight to ten temple presidents. Uh, some serving presently, two or three right now. So yes, there's been a contribution for the church. I don't know of a stake. And there are stakes that are more prominent. There are stakes that are more impressive, probably. But none to equal those records I've just talked about. Very good. Now, tell us a little bit about the many temples in Mexico, the dozen of temples that are now dotting the countryside. Mexico will have, in a, within a couple of years, the last two temples being dedicated. Guadalajara will be dedicated the first of the year, and uh, Monterey is under construction. There won't be a country in the world, including the United States, who per capita of member in the the ratio to temples will have more temples per member than Mexico. And I think that's significant. That says something. Section 49, the day of the Lamanite is now coming. They will blossom as a rose, and they are. 185 stakes, 12 temples. I had the privilege of being called to President, Kimball, President Hinckley's office before he announced the first three small temples. Elder Gerald Taylor and I, he president in the Chile area, and I was president of the Mexico North, were called to President Hinckley's office Friday morning before he announced the temples, three temples. And he mentioned that there would be, he was going to announce three temples at conference, three small temples. One in the Mormon colonies in northern Mexico, one in Monticello, and one in Anchorage, Alaska. We were thrilled. We were thrilled. Later, I was uh, privileged to be in President Hinckley's office with Elder Carl Pratt. He president of the Mexico South area. I was president of the Mexico North area. And he said, I'm going to announce 30 temples this week, this conference. He already had the ones in Mexico where they were going to be, and he asked us, he had a map on his desk and said, I'd like your advice, brethren, to tell me if I've put these, we will put these in the right locations. And uh, on his tour through our area of northern Mexico, we were finishing up on the 14th of March, in Ciudad Juarez. We were flying from Chihuahua to Ciudad Juarez in the jet that he flies in. And Don Staley, his secretary, I was sitting on the couch in the plane by the prophet, and he said, Don, 
Let me see that book we've got there. I didn't know what they were talking about. Don handed him a folder, black folder, three-ring binder. He opened it. I couldn't see what was on the page. He said at that time, we will have to add 10 more to that list. I had no idea what the list was. This was two weeks before he invited us into his office saying he would announce 30 temples. With the two tours he made in Mexico, south and north, I guess at that time or somewhere during that time, he decided that there'd be more temples in Mexico. It was my privilege to do the groundbreaking for five of those temples and to be involved in the dedication of two with them, with the prophet and with uh, President Monson and President Packer. Very good. Go get stole. You know, it's interesting. Five of those temples are in.